Okay, I've got the recording going on. So please, Muldrow, uh, whatever. All you right. Want. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, so I'm Muldrow Etheridge, a grad student at UMass Amherst. And today I'm going to talk about a paper titled Sharpening the Distance Conjecture in Diverse Dimensions. And it's co authored with Ben Heidenreich, Sami Kaya, UAQ, and Tom Rudelius. So the overview of this talk will begin, well, I'll begin by discussing the history and background of the distance conjecture and its close relative, the scalar weak gravity conjecture. And I'll tell you about our proposed sharpened version of the distance conjecture and our proposed sharpened version of the scalar weak gravity conjecture. In support of, your, of our proposal, um, I will, argue that there is evidence for our proposal from dimensional reduction and also from top-down examples. So M theory compactified, for instance. Um, and then I'll end uh, or I'll conclude the talk with a discussion about potential future sharpenings that can be done. And I'll summarize the main results. Let me take you to 2006. In that year, Aguri and Vafa released their seminal paper on the geometry of the string landscape and the swampland. This paper contains conjectures about the moduli spaces that parameterize the string landscape. Today, I will focus on their conjecture number two, which has since been called the distance conjecture. So before I discuss conjecture number two, I'd like to discuss conjectures zero and one. And these conjectures pertain to the moduli space, the metric on the moduli space, and infinite distances on the moduli space. Let MathCal M denote the moduli space of a consistent quantum gravity. Conjecture zero of the Oguri and Vafa paper states that points on the moduli space are given by the expectation values of scalar fields phi. A here is an index which labels which scalar field we're talking about. I'll refer to these scalar fields phi as the moduli. The metric on moduli space is given by this GAB of phi, where GAB is the kinetic term of the scalar fields in the effective action. We can use this metric to define a distance function on the moduli space. So if you give me, if one is given two points on the moduli space, P1 and P2, then this distance function will give a non-negative real number that is the length of the shortest path connecting P1 and P2. And this length, is computed using this metric. Conjecture one of the Oguri and Vafa paper states that for any point P naught in the moduli space and any positive real number T, there is another point P in the moduli space such that the distance between P and P naught is greater than T. So the takeaway from this claim is that if you have any starting point p naught in the moduli space, you can go arbitrarily far away in the moduli space from your starting point. Now we're ready for conjecture two of their paper. Conjecture two states that compared to the theory at point p naught in the moduli space, the theory at point p provided that the distance between P and P naught is sufficiently large, has a tower of exponentially light particles with masses scaling exponentially with the distance separating the two points. Here, kappa subscript D is the gravitational constant and lambda is some positive number. This is the distance conjecture. Many papers have been written about lambda. For instance, for some recent papers, 
there are these papers, and these are not all of the papers. Many papers have been written about Lambda, yet there has heretofore not been a consensus on which values of Lambda are allowed. In our paper, we propose the sharpened distance conjecture. And the sharpened distance con in the sharpened distance conjecture, we propose that for a theory with D space time dimensions, the lightest tower in any infinite distance limit has a lambda greater than or equal to one over square root of D minus two. And this whole talk, or this is the most important equation or inequality in the entire talk. This is our main result, this, this right here. Why do we propose this? Well, this bound behaves nicely under dimensional reduction. In all of the examples we have checked, this bound has always been true. In naive counterexamples, heavier towers with lambda less than one over square root of d minus two are always accompanied by lighter towers satisfying our bound. And finally, this bound is saturated in many examples. Now I'd like to tell you about the close relative of the distance conjecture, which is the scalar weak gravity conjecture. It comes in two manifestations. The original version of the scalar weak gravity conjecture, which, which is an inequality, I'll refer to it as the inequality scalar weak gravity conjecture. And there's also the convex hull scalar weak gravity conjecture, which is a stronger statement and actually implies the inequality scalar weak gravity conjecture. To define these, I'll have to introduce the notion of scalar charge to mass ratio vectors, or I'll call, or zeta vectors, as we'll call them. The scalar charge of a particle with mass m of phi is the partial derivative of the mass with respect to the moduli divided by the gravitational constant kappa. For a particle with mass m, the scalar charge to mass ratio vector at a point in the moduli space is defined as, well, it's the scalar charge to mass ratio vector. Um, and it can be conveniently written as uh, a derivative of the logarithm <clears throat> of the mass with respect to the moduli. And also, whenever we talk about these scalar charge to mass ratio vectors, um, it is convenient to canonically normalize the moduli at the point in moduli space we're talking about. So what that means is we rescale the moduli at that point so that the metric on moduli space is just the identity. Um, this can be done locally in the moduli space. For an example, um, given a single canonically normalized modulus phi and a particle with mass scaling exponentially with that modulus like here, then the zeta vector for this type of particle is just lambda. There should be a logarithm right there. Now I can tell you about the inequality scalar with gravity conjecture. The inequality scalar weak gravity conjecture states that there exists a particle with a zeta vector such that the length of the zeta vector is greater than some constant lambda min, some uh, real number non-negative lambda min, uh, positive. The convex hull scalar weak gravity conjecture says that the convex hull generated by the set of zeta vectors contains a ball of radius lambda min centered at the origin. So for instance, if these red points are zeta vectors or scalar charge to mass ratio vectors, they contain this ball of radius lambda min centered at the origin. Now I'll tell you about how we sharpen these two statements in our paper or our proposed sharpenings of these two statements. 
of these two versions of the scalar gravity conjecture. We propose that in a theory with D space-time dimensions, the lambda min appearing in the inequality scalar weak gravity conjecture and convex hull scalar, scalar weak gravity conjecture satisfies lambda min is greater than or equal to one over square root of D minus two, the same lower bound as our sharpened distance conjecture. Why this bound? Well, this bound behaves nicely under dimension reduction. This bound is satisfied in all of the examples we have checked. And this bound is sometimes saturated, and actually many times saturated in examples. So I keep saying that uh, dimensional reduction or serves as evidence for our sharpened, our proposed sharpenings. Um, one reason for using dimensional reduction as evidence is dimensional reduction is a good way to sharpen swampland conjectures. Other rigorously tested swampland conjectures, such as the absence of global symmetries, the weak gravity conjecture, and the repulsive force conjecture, are exactly preserved under dimensional reduction. Actually, it turns out that the inequality scale weak gravity conjecture is exactly preserved under dimensional reduction when we use lambda min is one over square root of d minus two. Also, many examples of the distance conjecture and convex hull scalar weak gravity conjectures are exactly preserved under dimensional reduction when we use lambda lightest is one over square root of d minus two or lambda min in the scalar weak gravity conjecture is one over square root of d minus two. So I'll, I'll show you this point here, that the inequality scalar gravity conjecture is exactly preserved under dimensional reduction when we used this proposed lambda min. So start with a tower in capital D dimensions with masses scaling exponentially with the modulus here. So the zeta vectors associated with this tower the value of the zeta vectors, there's just one component, the phi component here, and it's just lambda sub d. Let's reduce this on a circle to get a lowercase d dimensional theory. <clears throat> well, it turns out that if this lambda subscript capital D is greater than or equal to one over square root of capital D minus two, then the lambda subscript lowercase d, the lower dimensional theories lambda, will be greater than or equal to one over square root of d minus two. This inequality is saturated when this inequality is saturated. Um, let me show you a picture of when this inequality is saturated. I'll show you a picture of the zeta vectors. So there are two moduli. One is the parent theory, the higher dimensional theories modulus phi. And this axis is the zeta vector for the phi charges. And then we also have another modulus, which is the radion, which controls the size of the circle. And this vertical axis is the uh, axis for scalar charge under the radion, scalar charge to mass ratio. And the zeta vectors in the lower dimensional theory that you get from the tower and the higher dimensional theory lie on the line segment between these two red points. Um, this line segment, notice, is farther from the origin, which is here, than all of the points in this uh, quadrant of a ball. And this ball turns out to have radius 1 over square root of lowercase d minus two. So all of these points on this line segment are farther from the origin or, or, or have a distance from the origin um, greater than or equal to one over square root of lowercase d minus two. So for this reason, the inequality scalar weak gravity conjecture is exactly preserved when lambda subscript capital D or when this, this equality 
inequality saturated. Let's now look at an example where the convex whole scalar gravity conjecture and distance conjecture are preserved using our proposed lambda min. So start in D dimensions with two towers of, or sorry, with two strings with tension scaling this way. Um, this is the case, for instance, in type 2b string theory, where we have the fundamental string and the D1 uh, brain. They, ha they have tensions that scale this way with the dilaton. So from these strings, we get two towers of particles from string oscillations. Um, the masses go like the square root of the tension and the zeta vectors are just plus or minus lambda subscript capital D. Let's reduce this on a circle um, using lambda subscript capital D as one over square root of capital D minus two. See what we get. Well, um, in these bottom three figures, the red points are zeta vectors for uh, various types of particles in the lower dimensional theory. Um, this is d greater than five, d equal five, equaling five, and d equaling four. Notice that in all of these cases, the ball of radius one over square root of d minus two is contained in the convex hull generated by the zeta vectors. Um, zeta winding refers to the zeta vectors for uh, winding uh, or string states or string winding states. Zeta KK are uh, KK or zeta vectors for KK modes. Zeta string are what happened to the string oscillations under dimensional reduction. And in 5D, we have the monopole string, which is right here. And then 40, we have the KK monopole, which is right here. Notice that the KK monopole's presence is very important in the 4D theory if you want to have this ball enclosed. If you don't have this zeta vector right here, this KK monopole, you would conclude actually that the ball enclosed at the origin has radius one over square root of D minus one times D minus two or one over square root of six instead of what we're proposing is one over square root of four and 40. Also notice that the string oscillation modes are the states on the boundary of the convex hull that are touching the ball. Now, so, so we have convex hull scalar with gravity conjecture and distance conjecture preserved under dimensional reduction for when, when we use the lambda min that we're proposing. So now let's look at some more examples. Let's look at M theory uh, toroidally compactified and see what values of lambdas we get in the distance conjecture and scalar weak gravity conjecture. Let's start with M theory on T1, which is type 2A supergravity. Uh, we have just one modulus, the radion, or from string theory, the string theory's string theory perspective, the dilaton, phi. And we have two types of particles. We have KK modes and we have uh, string oscillations. And these strings are coming from M2 brains that wrap the, the, the torus or the circle. And the zeta vectors for these two types of particles are here. Um, the distance conjecture is satisfied. If we go in the large radius limit, we get a tower of light KK modes. If we go in the small radius limit, we get a tower of light uh, string winding modes, or sorry, string oscillations. Um, and also the convex whole scalar gravity conjecture is satisfied. And lambda min is one over square root of D minus two. Uh, in fact, it's saturated. Here. Um, I, I would like to point out that uh, the distance conjecture and convex hull scalar gravity conjecture is also satisfied with this lambda min for type one and type two B string theory. See our paper. 
Um, we can then go to M theory on the two torus. So there are going to be three moduli, and the zeta vectors are, are that thus going to live in a 3D space. And it turns out that the zeta vectors for quarter BPS states lie on a cone here. Um, and this cone encloses a ball centered at the origin with radius one over square root of seven, which is radius or which is one over square root of D minus two. And some fun observations about this cone. So the tip of the cone here and the base of the cone are populated uh, by zeta vectors for one half BPS states. So in fact, the zeta vectors for one half BPS states um, are sufficient with a convex hull generated by the zeta vectors for one half BPS states encloses the convex hull generated by the zeta vectors from quarter BPS states. Also, a fun fact is that the points on this cone that touch this ball are string oscillation modes. So this is a reoccurring fact that the string oscillation modes are the points on the boundary of these convex hulls that um, have lambda min or, or have zeta vectors of length one over square root of d minus two. We can then compactify M theory on uh, higher dimensional tori, so the three torus all the way to the seven torus. And the convex whole scalar with gravity conjecture and distance conjecture continue to hold with lambda min being one over square root of D minus two. This is non-trivial. Um, for instance, for <clears throat> the seven torus, there are 70 moduli and many sources of particles. Uh, you can see our 22 page appendix in our paper for details. There are many more examples where the distance conjecture and scalar weak gravity conjecture are satisfied with lambda min being greater than or equal to one over square root of D minus two. In a future talk, Sami Kaya will discuss further evidence from minimal supergravity examples, as well as phenomenological implications of this bound. <clears throat> also, it'd be interesting to further sharpen the distance conjecture and convex whole scalar with gravity conjecture using dimensional reduction. So we could have the distance conjecture and convex whole scalar with gravity conjecture satisfied in a higher dimensional theory. But if we don't have strings, for instance, or two brains, and if we reduce that theory on a circle, we're not going to have the distance conjecture or the convex whole scalar with gravity conjecture in the lower dimensional theory, because um, we won't have states that get light as we make the circle's radius small. So the distance conjecture and convex whole scalar weak gravity conjecture are not exactly preserved under dimensional reduction. Um, and it'd be interesting to further sharpen these two conjectures. Um, so I should point out that um, if you have gauge fields and you, uh, and when you reduce gauge fields, you get axions. Um, the further sharpened version of distance conjecture, convex whole scalar weak gravity conjecture, will likely involve the weak gravity conjecture. This is because the axion charges, axion scalar charge to mass ratios um, will depend on the gauge charge to mass ratios in the higher dimensional theory. And the weak gravity conjecture tells us a lot of stuff about that. So let me summarize the main result of our paper and our talk, and this talk. Um, we propose that in any infinite distance limit, the lightest tower implied by the distance conjecture has lambda satisfying this inequality. We also propose that lambda min in both versions of the 
scalar root gravity conjecture satisfies this similar looking inequality. These bounds behave nicely under dimensional reduction. And there are many examples where these bounds are satisfied and saturated. And finally, we know of no examples where our proposal is violated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mudro, for your very nice talk. Uh, it was uh, perfect in time. We have uh, a few minutes for questions. So <clears throat> maybe while we wait for questions from the audience, uh, let me ask one question. So uh, at the at the beginning, you mentioned that your your proposal has implications for scalar potentials, and I, I don't think you you came back to that. Do, do you mean uh, that is it some relation with the Sitter conjecture or asymptotic bounds on the scalar potential? Or have you thought about this? Um, so I, I did not discuss this in my talk. This is um, this will be uh, I think discussed in a future talk by Sami. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I could uh, I could jump in and say a little bit if that's okay, Mara. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, basically, what it implies is that um, the uh, in order to have for, in order for the Hubble scale to remain below the collusive Klein scale and the string scale, um, then uh, it gives you a bound on, uh, on how the Hubble scale changes in asymptotic limits. And uh, this can in turn be translated into a bound on the potential, which basically says that the gradient of the potential divided by the potential in asymptotic limits has to be greater than or equal to two over the square root of d minus two. So it's just a factor of two times what we're finding, what we um, have found here. Mm -hmm. um, so as Mulder says, I think Sami will <coughs> talk more about that in a future talk. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you both. Um, there's also a question by uh, Jose. Yes, hi, hello. Thanks for letting me talk. So I want to ask, uh, the scalar trust mass ratio uh, a priori will have a dependence on the point in modular space. So, I mean, you will have a convex hull at each point. In the yes. cases you have talked about, isn't the, I mean, is there no dependence or is that you're taking some specific asymptotic limit in which you test the, the conjecture? Oh, sorry. So you're asking whether the convex holes and the toroidal compactification depends on the vacuum expectation values of the moduli. It turns out yes. that this figure doesn't depend at all on the expectation values of the scalar fields when we canonically normalize the scalar fields. So this figure, um, anywhere we are for any torus with any shape parameters or volume, this figure will look exactly the same and the result will be the same. Um, there are cases- that... Yeah, sorry, please go on. Um, there could be cases where <clears throat> This more complicated examples where the shape of the zeta vectors would change if you moved around in moduli space. But in this case, it, it turns out to be exactly this shape. Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, thanks. thanks. Can I ask a related question quickly? Sure. Comment? Uh, maybe you can remind me if this is true, Muldrow, but if I plotted all the individual points for the BPS states, would they would be moving around? Just the overall shape doesn't change, or is, is that correct? Oh, yeah. So the overall shape definitely doesn't change. Um, I think that uh, the actual points would probably change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they'd flow around on this cone, but they would still be on this cone. Yeah, that's what I thought. Thanks. Okay, uh, any other quick question from somebody in the audience? No. 
Okay, otherwise we're perfect in time. So let's thank uh, Muldrow again. Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, there's Thanks. Thanks.